My husband began a travel nurse anesthetist career in 2022. Our family of six plus our large dog travels together. Before my husband accepts a contract, I check to make sure there is available housing for our family size within our budget by checking Airbnb, the RBO, and Furnish Finders. Then I ensure that some of the available housing is within decent areas by checking the maps on crimegrade.org. If there are at least a few options, my husband can go ahead and sign the contract. Depending on the contract, I start seriously looking for housing around 30 to 60 days out. Furnished Finders is my first pick for finding housing, but if I were to just browse Furnished Finders, I can't see all of the housing options. Because of this, I have created housing requests for the past two contracts. I simply log into Furnished Finders, go to my housing request, and click Submit a new housing request. Then I enter in the move-in dates, location, number of occupants, property type, budget, and I check that I'm traveling with a pet. Afterwards, I wait a bit for the landlords to contact me with their properties. I will add that Furnish Finders has the option for renters to fill out a profile. Ours includes family picture and a picture of our dog, as well as my husband's occupation. The first housing request I made was for Southern New Hampshire. We ended up with three options within a week's time. The next housing request I made was for East Texas, and within a few days, I had three great options to choose from. Here are the Furnish Finder places we chose in New Hampshire and Texas. The very first contract my husband had was in East Texas in 2022. I did not know about Furnish Finders yet, but I did find a place on VRBO where we stayed for three months. His second contract was in Iowa, and he found an unfurnished three-bed, two-bath duplex in the area. And I do have a link in the description on how I furnished that for $3,000. Check out our rentals in those places. One major concern travel healthcare workers have with renting is the potential of getting scammed out of their deposit and first month's rent. Many people say to rent a hotel for the first few days and check the furnished rental out in person before signing the lease. But because we have a large family, I'm concerned that we wouldn't be able to find a suitable rental for the bulk of our stay if we went that route. Here's what I do to significantly lower the chances of getting scammed. When I find a place that I might rent, I do a little digging on the landlord or the owner of the property. First, I go to the city or county tax collector to look up the address so I can find out who the owner actually is. All the places we've been have this feature online, but that might not be the case everywhere. Sometimes the owner is a person and sometimes it's an LLC or corporation. The name of the owner should match the name of the lease as the owner or the landlord. If the owner is using a property management company to handle the leasing of their home, then I want to make sure that company is legitimate. If that's the case, I can go to the applicable Secretary of State's website and look up the business name that's being used on the lease. If it is an LLC or a corporation, it will be listed on their website. It would be odd if a bo bogus company was listed on the Secretary of State's website. Also, if the owner is a person, I do Google searches to attempt to verify that that is actually a real person. For example, the couple we rented from in Iowa consisted of a firefighter and a nurse practitioner. 
that live next door to the rental. I was able to verify all of this within 20 minutes of searching Google. I checked to see if the landlord is on Facebook and LinkedIn just to check to see if the person's profile is in line with what I know about them based on our phone conversation and based on the lease. I have read that others simply ask for proof of ownership from the person they're renting from, but I think that they could they could possibly fake ownership documents, so I just prefer to do my own homework. One last thing to add is that when my husband is giving housing stipends, those are just meant to cover housing for him, for one person. We knew that when we began traveling that we would likely pay more for housing than what was in the housing allowance. There was one contract we didn't even get a housing stipend. It was a place we wanted to explore and the hourly rate was still enough for us to maintain our lifestyle, so we took the contract. I hope this information helps you. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section. If you found this video informative, please like and subscribe to be notified when another video is available.